Okay, um, let's go ahead and start uh, the first. We have a fascinating uh, presentation, work, uh, so I don't want to take anything away from the presentation. I just wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's the last week of the semester. Everybody is really, really busy, so you have really honored us with your presence. The Chancellor is here, the Vice Chancellor is over here with uh, the trustee, both with the President of Board of Trustees, uh, with uh, distinguished faculty, uh, with uh, administrators, the staff, and with students. And, and, uh, and I really welcome all the students here. Uh, Dr. Grotov has, uh, has uh, given his uh, presentation to our students as well. And I can tell you, as a former student of him, he's one of, but I, I can honestly tell you, he's by far the most fascinating lecturer I've ever had, like the pleasure and the honor of attending uh, our his presentation. So you would, be, you would be really well blown away by his knowledge and by his expertise and by his presentation, and there will be enough time at the end to work to, for question and answer. So without any further ado, I will give you the mic to our uh, venue and our student work here that is venue. Uh, this, this event is sponsored by Mother United Nations uh, Student uh, Program as well as our Political Science Student Asso uh, Association. So we welcome you and uh, without any further ado, so I will turn the microphone there so we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Distinguished RCC Model United Nations Program and the Political Science Department, we thank you all for taking time out of your day and attending our book talk. We are honored to have with us today one of the most renowned scholars of the Pacific Rim, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Portland State University, Oregon, and best-selling author, Dr. Mel Gertal, who is here to launch his latest book, Engaging China. Dr. Gertal is an alumni of prestigious university universities such as Columbia and Stanford, and has dedicated his life to studying American foreign policy in Asia. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Mel Gertal. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the Model United Nations Program uh, and the political Science Students Association for inviting me here. Uh, this is the second time in about five years, I think, that I have uh, spoken on campus. And it's always nice to come back to uh, one of the places that I could say is uh, my roots, because I did spend some 15 years or so uh, teaching at UCR. And I don't often, you know, I'm in Oregon, in a very tiny <laughs> enclave. Uh, in Western Oregon, and I don't get down to uh, even to Los Angeles, let alone to, um, to Riverside. So, and of course, we don't have sunshine like this, so it's a, it's a great opportunity, and I thank you very much. And I especially thank uh, Professor Darush Havigat for bringing me back here. Um, it's always a wonderful thing to be able to see him. Um, <clears throat> engaging China. If I were a government, a US government spokesperson uh, giving this speech, I would say uh, in just a, a few words that the United States and China have had a fraught relationship now for a great many years. Directly and indirectly, we have had all kinds of conflict and rarely moments of cooperation. And mostly, it's China's fault. Uh, the, the Chinese have, have pushed us and our allies uh, very hard in the Taiwan Strait and, in, uh, uh, and on the Korean Peninsula and even uh, more recently in, in, in Europe and in Africa. And the Chinese have become uh, very uppity and have violated some of the most important norms of, of international life. They haven't played, again, I'm a government spokesman here, they haven't played by the rules. And for the United States, therefore, the challenge is how to properly manage this combustible relationship uh, so as to preserve, as is customary for the United States, uh, the rules of, of order, uh, of international order, and keep the peace and stability, not just of East Asia, but of the world. That's the official line. 
It hasn't changed. Uh, it wasn't changed before President Biden took office. It didn't change after he took office. And it hasn't changed even with their most recent summit meeting in Bali between the president and China's president, Xi Jinping. Uh, after all, that was the very first in-person meeting between uh, those two uh, leaders. And so it raises a question, and it's all, after all only been about a month since that Bali get-together. And China specialists like myself uh, and others, other pundits and so forth, were, have been wondering what, what to make of that meeting. Because uh, after all, uh, it was that first the first time that they had met in person. There had been a couple of virtual uh, meetings between the two, which went reasonably uh, well. And there were, as a result, uh, both positive and negative uh, reactions to, to the meeting. On the positive side, uh, and with good reason, uh, there were some uh, areas of agreement between uh, the two leaders. Uh, for example, uh, President Biden said that uh, he could see that uh, there would not be, not likely be war between the United States and China. That uh, the, and in fact, uh, in answer to many predictions, he said, uh, I don't believe that China is going to invade Taiwan, which many have predicted, including within his own administration, even to the very present, and notwithstanding that, that, by, that uh, uh, gathering at uh, uh, Bali. Um, President Biden also said that, uh, so far as he was concerned, uh, the chances of war between the United States and China uh, had been minimalized. And in agreement with the President Xi uh, on the nuclear issue in particular, uh, they agreed with something that President Reagan had said many years ago, that a nuclear war uh, should not be thought of as, as something that could even, could even happen, and that there would be no winners if there was such a conflict. On President Xi's side, uh, he expressed some satisfaction that the United States finally, uh, with the words, very specific words of President Biden, agreed that there is only one China, uh, which has always been, uh, ever since President Nixon made his famous China trip in 1971, uh, a fixture of US policy rhetorically, but not necessarily uh, in practice. Uh, President Xi uh, also uh, appreciated that, uh, that the United States was not looking forward to, uh, to actual conflict with China. And so it seemed on the surface that maybe, maybe things were finally beginning to move in a new direction in U.S.-China relations. So I'm here to say that although I would welcome uh, such a step, and in particular would welcome a more regular set of contacts between high-level U.S. officials and their counterparts in China that I don't think that's actually happening. And that there's a considerable gap uh, between promise and performance. You know, the Chinese use the same expression uh, that we use, that seeing is believing. Bai wen bu ru yi jian. Seeing is believing. And, and here I, it's, it's a message in particular for, uh, for all of you students of international affairs. I think one of the cardinal rules in analysis of international affairs, especially when it involves the relationship between adversaries, is that seeing is believing. And that one should, in particular, look at the world through the eyes of the other. It's not a matter of agreeing with the other's point of view, but it is absolutely crucial, in this case, to see the world through Chinese eyes and not just American eyes. Because otherwise, we get into a situation of self-righteousness about our cause and the willingness to believe uh, the kind of characterization that I began this lecture with, that it's all China's fault. It just doesn't work that way. 
Let me read you something. It's just, a, it's just one line. And it came right after the Bali meeting. Uh, it's a document called uh, the Biden-Harris National Security Strategy Paper. And here's the one line. The People's Republic of China harbors the intention and increasingly the capacity to reshape the international order in favor of one that tilts the global playing field to its benefit, even as the United States remains committed to managing the competition between our countries responsibly. <coughs> Words are important. The Chinese read English. They are looking at what we are saying and doing and not just listening to what presidents happen to say amidst the swaying palms of Bali. It's a nice place. Um, but if I'm a Chinese leader, I'm going to be very suspicious that what was said at Bali matches up against American performance. And the Chinese have very good reason, I mean, we have our own reasons, but the Chinese have very good reason to doubt that we're on the same page with the Americans. To the contrary, here's what I see as a Chinese leader uh, looking at the United States since President Biden took office. Now mind you, of course the background is also very important. Many years of, of conflict, many years of disagreements over, over our history, over our values, and so forth. Uh, but in the more recent times, we are coming out of, a, of an, a, an administration, namely the Trump administration, that first and foremost was bullying China, especially on trade. In fact, that's all President uh, Trump really ever cared about was trade, right? He, had, he made the famous remark, uh, I'm tariff man. <laughs> and tariffs became his, his obsession. But he was also surrounded by a bunch of ideologues um, who thought that this was, the struggle with China was most, most importantly was a matter of, uh, and in very Cold War terms, was a matter of uh, the Communist Party of China against us. And now the Chinese have reason to be somewhat optimistic that Trump has been defeated and here comes a liberal administration. And therefore, the promise of maybe returning back to some of the better days under uh, President Obama. But what happens? The president appoints as his top national security and foreign policy officials, guys who have already determined, and they've been in print for this for a couple of years now, that engaging China is off the table that this is a, an enduring confrontation and has to be dealt with primarily by the United States forming or revitalizing coalitions with other like-minded folks in East Asia, namely the Japanese and the South Koreans, and in Europe with NATO, uh, to confront China and contain its rise. Exactly the sort of thing that the Chinese most feared. And so from the very get-go, the United States has been a great disappointment to Chinese officials and to intellectuals who follow uh, national security affairs. As they see the, United, uh, the, the Biden administration, uh, it is leading a new Cold War crusade against China. And what they see is that the Biden administration not only has adopted the tough tariffs against China that prevailed under Trump, but most, even more significantly, that they have been building coalitions, in, especially uh, in East Asia. Two of them are called AUKUS and the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, is Australia, United Kingdom, United States. And the quadrilateral group includes Japan and Australia, uh, again, as well as India and the United States, in addition to the long-standing security treaties that the United States has had uh, ever since the end of, almost since the end of World War II with Australia, South Korea, and Japan. So if, again, 
through Chinese eyes, you look at the strategic picture in East Asia, and you get the sense that no matter what the president has said at Bali, uh, in fact, there's a buildup uh, of efforts to contain China's rise, to deny China the ability to be an equal force in international affairs. And that uh, denial cuts deeply into the Chinese psyche because, after all, uh, China has become a major power in the world. It really, uh, I mean, in many ways, does not rival the United States, certainly not yet in military power. But in terms of global influence, it is expanding uh, tremendously, you know? Uh, particularly in uh, Africa, where Chinese aid has become uh, more, far more significant than any Western assistance, uh, under what is called the Belt and Road Initiative, a, a trillion dollar uh, Chinese aid program, although aid means, in this case, loans, not, not uh, simply a giveaway uh, of, of dollars. Um, and uh, in terms of its overall uh, impact in, in, every, in international organizations, like, of course, the United, the United Nations, in terms of international finance. So uh, the Chinese are, among other things, insisting, and have been insisting since actually the Obama administration, on, e on equal status. And, in, and very specifically, what they, what they mean by that is uh, a new international order no longer subject only to rules made in Washington. And that, as you can imagine, has never, no American administration, Democratic or Republican, has been willing to accept. What the Chinese are, are specifically insisting on is what they call five assurances. And they are, one, no Cold War, no change in China's political system that is forced upon it from the outside. No anti-China alliances. No Taiwan independence, which is China's red line when it comes to Taiwan. And no conflict with China between the United States and, and China. And of those five assurances, which in a way you could call five no's, uh, three of them have not been acceptable to the United States. The, the position of, of the U.S. is that the rules of the road are for China to accommodate. You know? uh, and, and by rules, I mean what in, in international uh, finance, uh, in arms control, in every other important area where cooperation really uh, needs to be on, on the basis of equal, equal status. So, um, so there's a problem right away in, in the way in which the two, these two great powers uh, are approaching one another. But beyond that is something that I haven't seen anywhere else uh, in, in discussions about the US-China relationship. And that is that the United States and China have a very fundamentally different notion of what constitutes national security. We're all familiar with what national security means to the United States. It's an outward looking security. Presidents of both parties have always agreed, certainly since the end of World War II, that national security, that America's national security is intricately dependent upon international security. And, and the formation of uh, international rules since the end of World War II in, in, in finance, you know, the so-called Bretton Woods Agreement, the creation of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund on the economic side was all, was all created in Washington in order to primarily benefit <laughs> this country, but within a global network of interlocked financial and aid uh, and trade institutions. So ours, ours is an outward looking, we, we are, to, it's always been felt that our American way of life depends upon this web of economic and certainly military agreements fundamentally made in Washington. But here's the, the thing, 
the Chinese look at national security from the inside out. The best way I can, I can put it is, just last year, uh, in the Chinese press, there came out a, an article in which Xi Jinping is asked the question, what is national security? And he said, national security is political security, and political security is regime security. For the Chinese, and this has been true his, you know, for a very long time, it's not peculiar to Xi Jinping, national security depends upon the security of the Chinese Communist Party, the one-party state in, within China itself. You, you, whereas the Americans will seek security by create, through international deployments of forces, and maintaining a, a, a web of, of rules favorable to global capitalism, and, or if you like, globalization, uh, the Chinese are most concerned about the security of the state. And today, that means the security of, that, of the particular leadership under Xi Jinping. That's why the most recent uh, demonstrations against the zero COVID policy were so important to China and needed to be dealt with very harshly. More that the protesting students and other, and other folks in China over the last few weeks were a matter of national security. And that, but that's just one element. Uh, the repression of Uyghurs and other Chinese Muslims in the far western province of Xinjiang, uh, a repression which, in my book, I call a genocide, uh, is another element of insecurity, and if you like, national uh, security. The American insistence on continuing to provide military assistance to a territory that China, that the People's Republic of China considers its own, Taiwan, in other words, that's a matter of national security. The decoupling of, of, American, of the American economy, especially with respect to advanced technologies, you know, semicon semiconductors and so forth, that's now taking place to the Chinese in terms of China's rise is a matter of national security. And so when Xi Jinping addresses uh, President Biden, as he did uh, very recently, he's talking a language that I doubt that the President Act or his top advisors uh, really understood. Here's what, among things that he said. Leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and China's socialist system have the support of 1.4 billion people. They are the fundamental guarantees for China's development and, ability, and stability. For China and the United States to get along, it is vital to recognize and respect such difference. Neither side should try to remold the other in one's own image, or seek to change or even subvert the other's system. At another point, he says, China has never sought to change the existing international order, does not interfere in the internal affairs of the United States, and has no intention to challenge or replace the United States. All addressing fears sometimes expressed by China experts here about what the Chinese are really up to. You know, essentially, they're out to get us and replace us, for example. But what she is really trying to get across is precisely what I've been trying to get across, that the concern that American pressure in one form or another uh, could be directed at what we popularly know, not know as regime change. Now to us, that seems, you know, on hearing it seems uh, not quite credible. I mean, why would, they, why would they believe that? But if you're a student of Chinese history, you understand full well that for a century and a half, that has been the common fear of Chinese leaders. As they, they have an expression, the fortress can most easily be ca captured from within. You know? 
Yes, it's true that they regard the United States as a, as a threat, but really the biggest threat to the Chinese party state is internal disorder. Internal disorder. And any American pressure from the outside is viewed as potentially interfering with and trying to capitalize on the many sources of internal disorder within China. The result being the overthrow of the existing system. That may be hard to understand from an American point of view because if I were, again, wearing that official government hat, I would say, well, that's ridiculous. We have no such in, uh, intentions whatsoever. <laughs> but again, viewed through the lens of Chinese history, as well as more contemporary developments, that is the great fear. And what it, what it should make you think about is this. It's very strange that here you have a, a rising China that has become, a, within a very, very short time, a, a great force in international affairs, and yet, what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that leadership is actually very insecure. Very insecure. And what makes the situation today in US-China relations particularly troublesome is that we also have our insecurities. Right? And I don't think I need to go very deeply into that. We are a badly divided country. Let's never mind the nice things that happened. I think nice things that happened in the last election. We are a deeply divided country. There is no, I don't think anybody, uh, any student of international, of American politics would, would find a rosy future ahead. The red, blue divide is going to go on for a very long time and who knows to what end. Democracy is in peril. And so we have two insecure leaderships, insecure for different reasons, uh, that nevertheless are at loggerheads on some very fundamental issues. For the Chinese, and here's something else that I think is, is not often, often well articulated, it's up to the United States to take the lead in trying to deal with this problem and, and lead, lead uh, both countries uh, away and toward a more stable relationship. The Chinese say, and by the, the Chinese, I mean not so much directly the Chinese leadership, but those Chinese intellect, defense intellectuals who, who are America watchers and are very familiar with, with our politics, uh, some of them having been educated in the United States at one point or another. And what they have been saying is that the United States actually drives the relationship. Why? Because they believe that the United States needs China less than China needs the United States. Strange. I'll repeat that. <laughs> The United States, in their view, needs China less than China needs the United States. And so their argument, and mind, mind you, this argument comes from a position of great pride in, in how China's rise has, has created a very powerful uh, country, um, but they are not, but they still believe that the United States sets the pace. You know? And therefore, it's going to be up to the United States to make a move to build upon the Biden-Xi uh, summit that, that was recently held. We will have to take the initiative. And I have to say that I see no evidence that, in fact, that is going to take place. Because summit meeting or not, the conversation at the highest levels in this country about China are very much of a piece. Uh, China is regarded as a strategic threat, and now and an even greater threat uh, than than Russia. You know, under under uh, Donald Trump, our National Security Council 
the State Department, in their various reports about U.S.-China relations, or on global, the global strategic picture, always said that China and Russia are equivalent national security threats to the United States. That's no longer true. The National Security Council and State Department and other, uh, uh, other institutions today say that there's a distinction here. China is now regarded to use, to use their uh, very specific language, which is kind of a, a strange way of, uh, of putting it. China is regarded as a pacing competitor. Pacing competitor. You know, I have to pause to say, I've spent some time in my career in the, in the bowels of the Pentagon, and I've always wondered, there must be some little office that uh, where, these, where some of these gnomes uh, work, and they devise these incredible phrases, you know, that just, where, why can't they use English? Um, so they distinguish between China as a pacing challenger and Russia as an acute challenger. What do they mean in plain English? They mean that China, unlike Russia, is a threat along multiple direct uh, dimensions. Economic, military, political, you name it. Whereas Russia uh, is, a, is a great deal less than that. Now, the problem here is that it's is twofold. One is seeing China in, in such a broad dimension of threat, uh, and at the same time, having the United States being in the position of having two nuclear weapon states as major enemies. That, I think, in itself is a very, a very dangerous uh, position. And very much as was the case during the worst stages of the Cold War, Elevating China to a threat that I think goes way beyond uh, the reality. You know, during the during the worst days of Cold War with the Soviet Union, there was a constant tendency, not only at the nuclear level but at other levels besides, to exaggerate uh, the Soviet Union, make it into a a, a, a gigantic a, a Goliath. Right? Uh, never really seeing the reality uh, of the Soviet Union until it finally came to pass with, the, with, with Gorbachev and the, uh, the elimination of, of the Soviet Union as, as an entity, you know, the, the, the collapse. Uh, a really bad, bad misreading of the enemy. And of course, there were reasons, I suppose, political uh, and otherwise to, to make make the Soviet Union something more than it was. But now we're doing the same thing uh, with China uh, by calling, by giving it this, this, this new title of a pacing uh, challenger. Because as I've, I've been saying, uh, the China, that you have a, a very insecure Chinese leadership. Fundamentally insecure because of, of serious sources of instability within, within that country. Instabilities that are very costly to deal with and that preoccupy uh, the leadership, you know, of which the COVID demonstrations are just the latest, uh, but certainly a very important uh, example. But that's, but those are not the only kinds of insecurities. I mean, you have a very young population with serious issues of unemployment. You have an aging population uh, that needs to be somehow uh, uh, taken, taken care of. Uh, you have an, uh, many different kinds of environmental problems that are uh, deforestation uh, and, and, and uh, water table being among just just two among uh, quite a, a few others, um, you know every country has problems to be sure, and uh, and it's it's not to exaggerate uh, China's problems to it, to the extent of saying well China is falling apart. Not not at all. It's not falling apart, but these are very serious problems that involve major allocations of resources that involve major attention by the Chinese uh, political leadership uh, and that are primary, primary, even more so than, uh, than something like the American threat. We are not the strategic threat to, as the Chinese see it, to them as 
they are in our eyes. And that's a, a, a disequilibrium that you know, has very important um, implications. So we have exaggerated uh, China's strengths and minimized its weaknesses. Um, and whereas I think the opposite would be a, a much better reflection of, of uh, Chinese realities. So it, as a result, we have uh, a, a great deal of support now in Congress and in the American public for, uh, for adopting a very tough uh, policy toward China. You know, um, during the Obama years, American public opinion very consistently was about 60-40 when it came to, to uh, the question of how do you view China. 60% favorable, 40% unfavorable. You know what, what it is now? 82% of the American public polled uh, regards China unfavorably. 82%. And that has come about because, like most public opinion on these such subjects, because of the framing of the question of China as a threat at the very highest levels, filtered through a media which is, has become very hostile to China, down to American public opinion. And so in Congress, uh, the notion of abandoning any idea of engaging China uh, has been picked up and is now one of the very few things that Republicans and Democrats in Congress actually agree, agree about. They, they don't agree on, any, on most anything concerning serving the American people, but they sure can agree that China is a threat. And so take almost any kind of uh, major legislation these days. Uh, I mean, one of them that comes to mind is the CHIPS and Science Act. And you'll find that Democrats and Republicans are all in favor of it. Why? Because it's fundamentally directed at China. So China has become the bogeyman, and the unifying factor in our politics. Everything we do seems to be about the competition with China. Now, I think competition is fine, uh, but it has reached a point where it's, it goes beyond just ordinary competition. It really has to do with seeing China in threatening terms. And that does not redound to our advantage. We are all in the education business, right? Uh, and what has happened is we have succeeded in alienating China's most promising researchers uh, and grad students, especially in the so-called STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, S-T-E-M, uh, where we've, over the years, uh, but especially under Trump, but now carried carry forward under, under Biden, adopted a very tough policy on visas. Uh, and with what result? Uh, these folks are going home. If they, if some have simply not been, been allowed in, but others who have very prominent people in the science fields uh, are simply returning back home, where they're now convinced that the opportunities that they came here for, for freedom of research and all that, uh, are no longer uh, available. And so that anti-China uh, fervor really results in shooting ourselves in our own foot. They, these folks are very important <laughs> to, uh, to America's building up a scientific <coughs> base. And that's just one element you know, of the total uh, picture in which we have succeeded uh, in cutting off uh, what could be a very fruitful partnership. And in areas that are very important both to ourselves and ultimately to the international community. And what I mean by that, of course, is at least three areas, uh, climate change, pandemic research, and nuclear weapons. And that's why the argument that I make in my book is about if, if nothing else out of self-interest, although I think also in the global human interest, it is so important to get back to the notion of engagement as a fundamental of American foreign policy when dealing with China. 
let me say this. Engagement as a word uh, is bantied about quite a bit. I mean, anytime anybody has contact with China, they say we're, we're engaged in China. That's not what I'm talking about. Yes, it's good that we engage, that we have diplomatic and people to people and other kinds of exchanges with China. But when I speak in my book and now here uh, about engaging China, I mean something much more fundamental. I mean that the United States, as a matter of national policy, should embrace the idea that of consistent, systematic, and sincere efforts to find common ground with China. That's engagement. And it requires that every step of the way, we think first and foremost about efforts to find common ground. It does not mean that we're trying to appease China. It does not mean that we stop talking about human rights in China, or for that matter, that they stop talking about human rights right here. Uh, it does not mean that we don't uh, deny access to certain technologies that obviously have military uh, implications. But it does mean that our effort is at what I call competitive coexistence. Competitive coexistence, of which the most important strategic element is engagement. That's, that's where we, we start out. And in fact, uh, we have had some considerable success in one of those areas that I just mentioned, out of climate change, pandemic research, uh, and nuclear weapons, which could be a model for what we could do for ourselves and the world if we chose to do it. Pandemic research. It's probably little known, but should be, uh, that over a number of years, until, the, until COVID, uh, US and Chinese researchers, epidemiologists and others were like doing pandemic research, were very successful in dealing with Ebola uh, and with SARS, among others. And this was with full support from the National Institutes of Health in both countries. That scientific collaboration uh, virtually was terminated under, under Trump and has never yet been revived. And yet, as people who are experts in the field uh, are not, uh, have informed us, you know, if we would only listen, it's, a, it's an example of what can happen you know, if we choose to put our minds to it. Finding common ground, building trust on the basis of accomplishment and seeing that, in fact, you know, our mutual interests can be, can be served. So engagement can have very, very fruitful results if we choose to make it, to put it front and center in, in uh, policy. Let me, uh, before closing, uh, say something uh, about Taiwan and also how engagement can be useful. Uh, something that uh, is within our our memories, because it just happened you know, last, summer, last summer. I'm referring to the, the trip that Nancy Pelosi took to Taiwan. Now, I, I think the world of Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> but I think that trip was a serious mistake that, in fact, could have been very fruitful if we had a policy of engagement. What happened? This, the, the forerunner to this, to Pelosi's trip, is that the US and China were in, in considerable, had considerable friction, it's, I mean, this has been true for many years, but a resumption of, of very serious friction over the question of, of Taiwan. Why? Because on one hand, the United States was contributing even more military uh, hardware and funds to Taiwan than were already the case. In fact, overloading Taiwan with military assistance. You know, those people who call for, and they're in Congress right now, and working on another $10 billion for Taiwan, but those people who were calling for even more aid, to, to military aid to Taiwan, forget that actually there is a backlog of $14 billion in military aid to Taiwan that, the, that Taiwan simply can't use. We're just hoping for political reasons, and of course with the full support of the so-called military industrial complex, <laughs> We're just overloading them. Just keep sending them weapons to show our support. So already there was 
uh, there was a, uh, a very substantial new push within the Biden administration uh, to give Taiwan more, more and more, and not only on the military side, but also trying to upgrade its political profile, which is what was causing a great deal of consternation in, in Beijing, because their red line is, we, we, we believe in peaceful unification with Taiwan unless Taiwan declares independence. And that push toward that red line was getting closer and closer uh, as the U.S. was tightening its relationship with Taiwan. And that trend is continuing right down to the present. Um, so, Pelosi's trip. She announces the trip, and President Xi says to Joe Biden, please cancel it. It will just ratchet up tensions between our two countries. And Pelosi, who said that she was taking the trip in order to enhance Taiwan's security, uh, turns to the president and says, well, if you don't want me to go, I won't go. <coughs> now, that was an, an engagement moment <laughs> because President Biden could have said, OK, President Xi, I, I realize that Taiwan is your most pressing uh, internal, because to the Chinese it's an internal matter, pressing internal issues. In fact, uh, at their uh, Bali summit, uh, she used the expression that Taiwan is the core of our core interests. Woman, Hushin Li, the Hushin. Are there any people speak Chinese here? Oh, okay. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> um, the core of China's core interests. That's that's we're saying quite a bit. So it is super sensitive. So Biden could have said to. President Xi, you know, I recognize how very sensitive the Taiwan issue is. Uh, I will, I will tell um, Speaker Pelosi not to go, but I also want you to stop um, having overflights in the Taiwan Strait that separates Taiwan from the mainland, and sometimes get a little too close to Taiwan. Those are very provocative, Mr. Xi. Uh, I want you to stop those, and I think what we can do is sit down and talk about security in the Taiwan Strait area to our mutual benefit. But that's not what Biden did, of course. He said, no, um, I, maybe I don't like the idea of, of uh, Pelosi going to Taiwan, but I'm not going to interfere. And so she, she went. In our own country, as, as a recent report, by what's called the Joint Committee, this is in Congress, the Joint Committee on Economic and Security Relations with the PRC, People's Republic of China, they predicted that when that happened, and, Ta and Pelosi was going to go to Taiwan, that, that China would have to react militarily. Indeed. And so, and then they predicted that as a result, the United States will have to pro provide even more military aid to Taiwan a perfect gift to the weapons manufacturers. And so, exactly as they predicted, China responded by uh, carrying out military exercises with the, with the clear message to Washington, we are capable of blockading Taiwan if we choose. And they carried out those exercises, you may recall, for about two weeks, and then, and then stopped, right? But, making it very plain that at any time, you know, this very sensitive spot could, could be a flashpoint. In fact, it is today the most important flashpoint in U.S.-China relations. And it can go south at, at, at any time. So it's a very dangerous city. And my point is, again, that if the United States looked upon China in a different way, with the idea that engagement should be the bedrock of our relationship, they could have approached that Pelosi issue in a very different way. And instead, they allowed it to go on with the result that, exactly contrary to Nancy Pelosi's purpose in enhancing Taiwan security, it diminished it. It diminished it. So now let me close, because I want to leave time for, for your questions, um, with an historical uh, footnote. 
At the very end of 19, the 1960s and into the beginning of the 1970s, Chairman Mao, you remember Chairman Mao, Chairman Mao made a strategic decision. China and Russia were having a border conflict, if you may recall. It was quite serious. And the Chinese leadership reached the conclusion that the Soviet Union was, even though a socialist country, was a, an imperialist country as well. And they used the expression, which had never appeared before, the Soviet Union is a social imperialist country. And out of that came a strategic decision to move to, to, to normalize relations with the United States, even though the United States was also called an imperialist country. But of the two, it was decided by Chairman Mao that the Soviet Union represented the greater danger to China. And thus came Nixon's trip to China and the start of US-China relations. Obviously, the reason I mention that is because the United States now faced similarly with two major adversaries, has a strategic decision that it has yet to make, but which I, I would like to. We are involved in a war with one of those two powers. The United States is involved in a war with Russia at this time, right? Let's face it. Doesn't have to have, we don't have to have troops in, in Ukraine, although there are advisors, of course. Uh, but we are at war with one power, and yet deciding that the other one, China, is the greater strategic threat. There is no logic to that. But there is logic, I, I believe, to beginning to take another look and make the kind of strategic choice that old Chairman Mao made way back in 1971. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that fruitful lecture, Dr. Griffin. At this time, we'll be doing a Q&A, and we'll take a couple questions. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Griffin? Uh, this is the question that says, I, I just want to mention that Dr. Griffin's book is here, and uh, the publisher has agreed to, uh, to offer this book at this, uh, for this presentation at, uh, at a discount rate. Uh, so uh, the, it's it's amazing what books. I really encourage you to uh, uh, to uh, purchase this book and uh, read it, and it will be truly fascinating. That was my marketing manager. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, I wondered if you could share your thoughts about uh, just you know this last little while or FBI director right? Does that have some quick things to say about China? I assume you could respond to it. Um, I, I assume, Elisa, you're referring to um, what you had to say about Chinese economic, about hacking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, we hack them, they hack us, <laughs> and hack, hack, hack all, all the time. Uh, I don't want to diminish it. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, deta the real raw details have yet to be I think really revealed it. it's an accusation, but let's let's say that yes, I think probably uh, over some some period of time China has been engaged in economic hacking. I mean that's I think I, I think their fundamental uh, interest is in is in uh, especially the access or, or uh, acquisition of technology. Um, quite different from from the Russians, you know, who are very busy interfering in elections and much else besides. So, um, but I think again, the, the, the real significance there uh, is not in any revelation that he's made about, about uh, the economic hacking. It's in just another piece in the effort to categorize China as an enduring enemy uh, and, and to get us to focus on the China threat. Uh, I think that's really what's mostly involved. Well, you and I, we go back to the Vietnam era, and so I'm, I'm, uh, what our foreign policy has done since then has not been uplifted for me from Vietnam. Uh, but you mentioned, uh, so China, there was an opening 
And uh, there was an international trade. China began trading with the West and, and so on. And in that competition, China basically won, at least up to the recent period. And I think that's kind of, that realization is kind of what's behind the sort of sudden Republican Democrat uh, unity on uh, trying to be stronger against China. I totally agree. It's not. It's not political. You know, we're not in any danger of the Chinese Communist Party uh, coming to the United States. It's not cultural. Um, but I think there is that antinomy there of, of, of what happened in the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of international economics. Yes. And, and I also agree with you uh, that you know we are at war with Russia, and it's sort of strange. I'm sorry. That, that, uh, well, anyway, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry, okay. I think I'll have my phone or something. Okay. It's probably Joe Biden. Would you tell him that we're busy? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I, I think there is that underlying insecurity here uh, about losing the economic competition to China. And sure, you know, you look, look at all the statistics. I mean, that, we, you know, we are very deeply interdependent with, with China, just, just talking about the US and China, uh, but uh, you know, we have a very, still a very large trade deficit in that in, within the total of $700 billion worth of overall uh, trade. And the Chinese have become the, ma the major trade partner of a number of countries where we traditionally had always been, like Japan or like South Korea. Uh, the Chinese are, this so-called so Belt and Road Initiative on, on loans uh, has brought in Greece and Italy. And so, you know, the Chinese seem to be everywhere and, econ and you know, economic diplomacy uh, has been very successful for China and we have a very hard time uh, dealing with that. And that's within the larger context of we have been used to being number one and we don't like the idea that there's competition all of a sudden, and especially the competition where we seem to be losing out. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, China has become far and away the most important uh, aid giver in Africa. Not always successfully, by the way, but nevertheless very prominent, you know, and, and at the same time, Western sources are, are in retreat. I'll give you another little case study um, that I've, I've, I've been studying, not in a place that you know, would strike our fancy, the Solomon Islands, okay? A group of islands in, in, in the uh, South Pacific. For a long time, uh, that, the government there, uh, under various leaders, had always been uh, very close to uh, both the United States and to Australia. And that goes back to the liberation of those islands from Japanese control in World War II. Okay, but then, uh, uh, now maybe a year and a half or so ago, there was an uprising, a political uprising in the, the Solomons. Uh, and uh, the, the government there decided to invite in uh, Chinese police trainers to help with, their, with the government's uh, police forces in dealing with, uh, with protesters. I'll leave aside all the details of, of, of that, but just to say this, that the decision to turn to China was because of years of neglect by the United, by the Americans and the, and the Australians. You know, we stopped paying attention to these folks. And what are these, and what are the people, in, you know, not just that set of islands, but throughout the South Pacific, what are they most concerned about? Climate change. And they've gotten no assistance on climate change for islands, some of which are going to be inundated and will disappear. And so the Chinese stepped in and what happened? The, the Pentagon got very upset. The first thing they said was, aha, the Chinese are really out to get a military base in, in the Solomons, which the Solomons government uh, denies. But even if that were true, if the Chinese would try to have some kind of naval access there, they're forgetting a very simple fact. The United States has military bases and, and uh, access points all over the Pacific. 
you know, from Hawaii to Guam to the Marshall Islands, you name it. Never, never mentioned in the press. It was all about the Chinese are coming. Again, another example of that. Um, so, you know, this, this competition sometimes turns on uh, misleading uh, things, misleading things, a lack of facts, and other, other things that, you know, we need to be uh, more aware of. And then we have a better way to assess, well, is China the threat that it's made out to be or not? Oh, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for your message, and I'm sorry, I'm over here. Oh, oh. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your books. I really hope that it reaches more American readers so that they're able to get a more critical um, aspect to think of more international matters and where our taxpayer dollars are going uh -huh. in regards to military aid and things of that sort. I like what you said, and to add on to it, there's a philosophical, psychological perspective that you have to look, look at it from their lenses than just American lenses as well. Because if you look at it, if you look at it that way, then that will help you understand where USA could be projecting its fears onto that country and then posing a, posing them as a threat so that they can improve their agendas that they're doing in the name of support from us as well, because it goes back to the Vietnam War. We've seen what that came when we didn't get the support of the American people. So as long as we continue to as our government continues to give off a message that's somewhat propaganda, that, you, that China is a threat to us, that's them projecting on their fears of what we are having with Taiwan. I would say that, I wanted to ask you, do you think that US is scared of losing their hegemonic state, as they claim, because of economic reasons? Whereas I would just counter, US could be, be fearful of that if we are still dominant in, you know, culture, entertainment, sports, mm -hmm. things of that sort. Um, you know, that's controversial with sports, but um, I would say, would you would you also say that America is pursuing an imperialistic journey in Taiwan in the name of NATO? Well, let's uh, let me. Ooh, that's very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me take the, the better, the larger part of, of, of your question. Um, uh, I think uh, I, I think actually I've, I've answered it for, uh, for the most part in talking about uh, where, where the United States is and, and not wanting to to uh, allow any challenger to, as they see it, to get the better of us. Um, so, <laughs> but. The, the fact of the matter is that if, if we had a whole different political uh, alignment, we would see actually what I thought Joe Biden saw when he first took office, namely that national security does begin at home. You know, does begin at home. It, be, it begins with the vibrancy of our institutions. It begins with putting tax dollars uh, into productive enterprises. Uh, it begin, and that includes recognizing that uh, we can't continue to spend the extraordinary amounts of money we are spending on weapons development. Um, it, it begins with, with looking at, at, at issues of, of social and environmental justice. You know, I mean, we're all, we're all I think, quite familiar with that. I just, just before uh, I uh, came here, I happened to notice that the House of Representatives, and mind you, still under democratic control, uh, just approved a, a new defense bill. I don't like, I call it a military spending bill. Uh, for $838 billion. $838 billion. I, that's where I thought you were going with your, starting out on exactly. taxpayers. <laughs> because that means us. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that, that there, is a, there is something Called national defense that requires a certain amount of money, but not that, but not the kind of money uh, that a, a great chunk of which could be used to to deal with climate, the climate crisis, and many other uh, crises that plague us uh, here at home, and in which we could be, you know, world leaders. Uh, eight hundred thirty-eight dollars. Uh, eight hundred thirty-eight dollars. Uh, billion dollars is just, you know astronomical, and, th and th the problem with that kind of military budget planning is that enough is never enough. 
And whether on the liberal side or on the uh, conservative side, with a few exceptions in Congress, uh, the belief is that, that the military budget is untouchable. Uh, it's sacred. And as long as something like that is the case, uh, we're going to simply, you know, within a matter of a few years, it'll be a trillion dollars in official military spending. Uh, yes, China is, uh, is spending a, a great deal of money every year. Year on year, it, it, its military budget it continues to increase, but it's um, one quarter of ours. Uh, you know, you can only, I would think, go so far with the notion of national security uh, before people start to get a little to the fact that, you know, this money, some important part of this money could be spent for real advancement in our society, you know? I mean, if we're really concerned about a foreign threat that is, uh, that primarily lies in the, in the realm of, of economic competition, well, then let's compete. But nothing, nothing seems to put a dent in hardware military hardware. And of course, doing that invites others to do exactly the same. And so we end up in this constant spiral, uh, which was, you know, which President Eisenhower so many years ago warned about, and which has never been taken uh, really uh, seriously. 